Razavan here for IFL TV in association with MTK Global. With me all the way from Detroit, Detroit's finest, JB, Jonathan Banks. How are we doing, sir? Hey, man. Everything well. I got no complaints. Other than being in quarantine, everything is good, man. Before we speak about boxing, um, as you just mentioned, everybody's in quarantine at the moment. I've spoken to people from New York, from Vegas. Um, what's the situation like in Detroit, and is it complete lockdown? Well, Detroit is not complete lockdown, but it's not it's not good either. Um, they have like right now, Wayne County slash Detroit has some of the highest rates of the coronavirus right now, man. It is insane, and mainly because no one listens. You know, everybody want to keep gathering together and act like the coronavirus is not real and is very real. So all the people that's affected by it, you know, we wish them all the best. And our prayers go out to the families that's affected by it. You know, my family's affected by it. You know, my mother lost a sister over it, you know. I got like uh, two family members in the hospital, like, well, three in the hospital right now in the ICU because they're on ventilators, you know, because they, they just, I don't know, man, it's like, no one's really listening and when they get it it's just it gets bad right away you know so it's terrible have people calmed down in the in the uk when it first got announced that we were going to go into lockdown or there were rumors that we were going to go into lockdown everyone in the uk started to flock to the grocery shops the supermarkets take everything off the shelves like toilet paper was like gold dust like that was the most right. in demand item here in the uk i'm not sure if it was the same in, in it Detroit. was the same thing here. Listen, I was, when the first start happened, I was in Vegas, training camp. And um, the problem was everybody was going to get toilet paper. And I said, for the life of me, I don't know why toilet paper is number one. I don't get it. Toilet paper is number one. Now you stuck in the house, you stuck in your home, and toilet paper is still number one. I'm thinking canned goods, water. That's more a number one for me. But toilet paper was the last thing I was thinking about. Somebody said to me, and I'll share it with you, that one of the reasons why they think toilet paper was in demand, because all these businesses close, so you have the commercial side, commercial companies that give toilet paper to businesses, and you have your normal production for household. Now, because everyone was going to be quarantined and at home, the household requirement for toilet paper would go up and the companies wouldn't be able to cope because there's too many people at home that they're delivering toilet paper to. Uh, that was just somebody's <laughs> rationale. Um, so I'm not sure how true that is. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not understanding that one because <laughs> um, toilet paper, when you're in a crisis and you stuck at home, you can't go nowhere and you get hungry, toilet paper is the last thing you think about. <laughs> you know, you think about water, I understand that. Food, canned goods, I understand that. Things that's not going to perish, non-perishables, you know. You got like all of you getting all these canned goods, I understand. All these different juices, I understand, because some, some of them don't expire for a long time. But toilet paper, that was a different one for me. For me, like, that's just on a personal level. That's the last thing I was thinking about. Mm -hmm. Especially when you can just use a bucket and fill out with water instead, right? Listen, yeah, I got a bathtub, you know? <laughs> so if I got to take a dump, I go wash myself in the bathtub, and whatever I got. I will find a way to get clean Yeah. if I'm home because I'm not hungry. You know, I got food, I got water, I got everything I need. But if I run out of toilet paper, that's not the end of the world for me. Um, Coach, let's move on to boxing. There was an announcement made today on Badu Jack's uh, social media pages that he has aligned with you and you will now be training him. Um, just want to give us a little breakdown on how that came about and how you was the one that Badu selected to become his new trainer and coach. I haven't heard nothing about that. I got to go check that out. Really? <laughs> I'm joking. I'm about to say. <laughs> <laughs> just the look on your face. That serious look is priceless, man. It's priceless. Now I remember you so well. Now that's why I had to do you like that <laughs> because it was so fun. Anyway, but uh, <laughs> um, 
first of all, yes, uh, as far as me training about Jack, it's, um, I've been knowing, like I say, these guys, I know they're not strangers to me because I've seen them. I've been around them a couple of times. And um, um, when I got the call to see if we can see if we can get a workout in together to see what the chemistry would be like. And he liked it right away. So I'm fortunate enough to be able to, to be able to work with him, man. He's a good dude, man. He's a hard worker. And at the end of the day, that's all you really want as a, as a coach or a trainer, however you call it. You just want to be with somebody who works relentlessly hard and is dedicated to doing their job. Because I am the exact same way. I've tried to do everything I can to work relentlessly hard. And I'm dedicated to doing my job and getting the win. Is it difficult from a coaching perspective when you've got a fighter who is used to doing things a certain way? He's not young. He's not at his young part of his career. He's coming towards the latter part of his career to then come in and start to adapt and change things. Is that difficult? Well, you know, it's a couple different parts in, in the answers of, the, of this question. If you want to do that, yes, it's completely difficult, almost impossible, almost. But um, I think the goal would not be to come in and try to change. I think the come the goal will come in. The goal is to come in any this for any fighter, any trainer. The goal should be to come in, and you already see what the kid has. But the goal is to come in and see what you could pull out of him. That's already there, though. What he has is already there. Everything I'm pulling out was already there. You know, it's like, um, you know, some people, like, you You ever heard the American Star Smaker Banner song? You know, the national anthem. You heard the American National Anthem song over and over again, right? And so, depending on who sings it, it sounds different. It could be long. <laughs> or it could be short, depending on the person who's singing. You know, so it is not that they singing it wrong and they singing it right. It's just a, it's just a simple fact of um, bringing out bringing out the song so everybody can enjoy it. And that song for me with Badu is just bringing out a lot of his natural ability so he can not so much. I guess it's almost to the point where he can win better. You know, he could better protect himself and he can go for the definite win and go for the knockout. Because that's, you know, how I was taught. We go for the knockout. Does it take time for you? Do you need time, not just a training camp, but you, do you need a number of fights to build that chemistry relationship and get the ideas merging together? I mean... Yes. In reality, yes. But in theory, you try to get as much as you can in while you're together. In theory, because it's like you going on a date with a girl, you know. By the time you're on your 10th date, like, y'all just laughing and talking, you know what I'm saying, about whatever is going on in life. But the first few, you look nervous. You don't know how close you should stand. You don't know how distance you should stand. You don't know what she's been through. She don't know what you've been through. You know, you don't know each other well. So anytime you with, anytime two people mesh together and they're around each other for a long period of time, yes, things does get easier. It should. But if it don't get easier, that's how you know those two people, they not mixing well together. So we gotta, we, we need to go, go our separate ways. He's not, like I said, he's towards the latter part of his career. You're known to obviously train Vladimir Klitschko as well. Vladimir fought into, I think he was 42, 43. Yeah. Um, do you think Badu could fight until that long as well? He, say, he says he looks fresh, he feels fresh, he feels younger. He's doing things that he wasn't doing when he was young, but can he go on for another four, five, six years? Man, I, I would say this. Instead of directly asking the question, I would say this. Um, you have a lot of media personnel that go off this foundation. Boxing was set up on a certain foundation, okay? And this was however many years ago. And um, 
certain things about the sport don't change, like um, knockout sales. That doesn't change. Um, when you got a big man that knows how to fight, he becomes the most dangerous guy in the world. That doesn't change. So many things, so such a few things about boxing don't change. But some things do change. Um, back in the 80s, even, let's not even go back that far. Back in the 90s, back in the early 2000s, the technology wasn't as advanced as it is now. The different vitamins and different foods, uh, organic foods that we have access to now wasn't available then. So these fighters, now the 37-year-old fighters, 38-year-old fighters, they're not your 1990 and 1980s 38-year-olds. Because by then, by then, these guys was worn out. Look at Pernell Whitaker at 38 years old. He was able to move, but he wasn't able to move like he was when he was 30. You know, it's just a different, it's a different area. It's different, it's, a, it's just different. And these guys are able to come in and be older and still perform. The last, look at Bernard. Bernard caught this, um, this modern era at the beginning. So look how long he was able to go. And he caught it at the beginning. And he was able to go to, he was late 50s, he was able to go. And he still, regardless of what you say about him, getting caught on top of the head, getting knocked down, he looked good walking into that ring. And his awareness was there. He was fully mentally and physically able to, to perform. You know, he just was, he just got, he started getting caught with different punches. So therefore, um, he, started getting, he started getting hurt a little bit more than, than he liked to. You know, but he was still able to perform. So, I'm saying that to say these fighters that has that willpower to continue and as long as they treat their bodies right, and the two guys we're talking about, I'm talking about Triple G and Badu Jack, they treat their bodies right. They stand in shape. So I think 37, 38, I don't think it's a, um, I don't think it's a downside. You know, I think it's more so of upside because they got more mental strength and they got just as much physical strength as the next guy. You talk about Triple G there. Um, obviously, haven't been with him a long time. Um, how's that relationship built? How has it been building since, obviously, the, that fight with Sergei Dovrachenko? Uh, we, um, it's great. We laughed, we talked, we was, in, we was in camp when this pandemic broke out, and we had to break camp once they closed all the gyms. And we all went on, went home. But um, uh, we it's great, man. He he's a he's a fighter's fighter. You know, he he really wants to be in the ring. He really wants to fight. He really want to get back to you know where he was at. You know, his fight with Sergei, it was quite a strange fight in fans' eyes. A lot of people thought Golovkin was going to come in and, and just walk through him. It turned out to be quite a tough fight for both fighters at the end of the day. But was that good for you to understand where Gennady was at this stage of his career? Well, I'll tell you this. People keep saying Styles make fights, but no one said nothing about this fight. When this fight was first, first presented to me, I didn't like it because, and when I first got to the press conference, I'm very, very open and honest about my opinion. I said, this fight is going to be like a Warden Gotti fight. This is going to be tooth and nail because if you make a statement saying Styles make fights, then I would like for more people to understand what style to this style comparison, what type of fight is, is it going to make? And I've been, the whole camp, I'm telling Triple G that this is going to be a bloody mess. I don't like the fight. It's going to be a bloody mess. If I had a, if I had a choice, I would have chose Dennis Andres or something. I mean, Dennis, um, um, not Dennis, but Andrade. What's the, guy, what's the kid's name? The 60. Oh, uh, Demetrius. Demetrius. Okay, yeah. I would have chose him because that would have been a better match. That would have been a better, that would have been a better fight, stylistic wise. And um, but this fight is a fan, it's a, one of the fan friendly fights because they get to go tooth and nail, toe to toe back and forth. You know, so like I say, I knew that it was gonna be that type of fight, but so that's why I prepared Triple G 
to be able to dig deep and be able to go those 12 rounds if, if needed. Jonathan, you know Canelo loves to fight May Day in September, uh, on one of those famous days. You say you're open with your opinion. After this pandemic, it looks like a lot of fighters will probably want to jump in those big fights because they've missed most of the year, missed earning. Because fighters don't earn if they don't fight. It's simple as that. Yes. Would you would you be happy to put him in straight with Canelo if that fight presented itself in September, October? No. They called me about it and I said no. I said, why do I have to... Like, the plan was for him to get this fight, get another fight, and then fight Canelo. Because when we went to Canelo and said, we ready, he said, no, I don't want to fight. And he disappeared and went and, do, he went and did whatever he wanted to do and refused to fight. Now he's saying, ah, okay, I'm ready. After this pandemic, let's do it. You know, he like, no, I, I already have something planned. So if you want to do this, let me get this this fight out the way. Then, then if everything's still a go, let's come together. A UK British fighter recently, I think it was last week, called out and said, "I want Triple G." I'm not sure if you saw the statement, Chris Eubank. Who said this? Chris Eubank Jr. <laughs> I really believe Chris Eubank Jr. was offered this fight a while ago, and he turned it down. So he's offering the he he's now he's calling for the fight. My question is, what does he have to offer? Like, and this is believe me, this is no disrespect to you being Chris Eubanks Jr. I I do everything I can to always give the fighters the utmost respect, always. And um, there's no disrespect to him, but if Triple G was to ask me. Um, should we, which, who should we fight? And I'm like, what does, what's on the table? What do we have to offer? So I think there's sometimes, when you have fighters and coaches relationship, sometimes you don't know who makes that final decision. Is it the promoter? Is it the manager? Is it, is it the fighter, the, the trainer? Who? And so in, with your fighters, are you the authoritative person who makes those decisions? Well, honestly, I like to say, I would like to say, I don't like to be a dictator to a certain degree. Certain things I need your opinion on. Because at the end of the day, you are going in there fighting. You are going in there taking these punches. I'm not. And a lot of coaches tell you, oh, man, we going in there together. We going to do this together. We going to the ring together. But I'm not, I understand this. I'm not taking these punches. So therefore, I'm gonna ask you, what is it that you want to do? If this is if this is your choice, if you look at me and say, "Coach, yeah, listen, man, this is my choice. This is what I want to do," and I'm gonna go out there and do everything I can to make sure you get your choice. You know, so if I, if I gotta go, if you're saying I don't want to deal with the business part right now, this is who I want to fight. Just gonna make it happen. Boom, I'm off to the races because I got a one track mind. This is what my guy want, and this is what we go do. You know, so every, with every, every, even dealing with Vladimir, um, I just wanted to talk to him to make sure this is who you choose. You know, this is who you want to fight. You know, and I just want to hear from them. So whatever happened in the fight, you get tired, um, you start acting a little lackadaisical, I got to use that against you. I said, yo, oh, man, whoa, whoa, where you going? You wanted this fight. They ain't this the fight you said you wanted? Well, you got to uh, let's pick up and fight then, you know. It's just a lot of things I just like to hear from the fighter directly and then allows me to do my job better.